Hello, everybody, and welcome to another interview with the artist. And today I am honored, honored is the best word I can I can say, by to be joined by somebody who mentored me, even though they had no idea they were doing it, just through their wonderful blog and inspiration of all the great miniatures and everything. Meg Maples, how you doing? It's so good to have you on. Thanks, Vince, for having me. I'm really happy to be here, and um, that was quite the introduction, so thank you. Uh, it's 100% true. I remember one of the first competitions I went to, somebody asked me, who is your, like, who is your, your inspiration? Like, who's an artist you like that you want to paint like? And I said your name. Like, that was, it was the only, the only source I quoted right there. So uh, that, that's a statement, I think, more than anything. It sure is. And I really appreciate hearing that. It's, um, you know, and now that I've been teaching for about 10 years, it's really nice to hear that I've had a positive influence on people in the community because that's, you know, what you hope for when you teach. A hundred percent. You've done so much great work that I like, that I, in fact, love and has been something that I know I've picked up as part of my own style, my, you know, trying to directly incorporate as best as I'm capable those things that you've done. And we're going to look at some of that wonderful, uh, one of the wonderful art later. I've got a piece up on the screen right now uh, for everybody. Uh, but of course, as always, I thought we'd start at the beginning. That's usually where we like to start on this show. So as I always say, this is a very weird hobby we have, Meg. Like we, we decided to take little tiny plastic and resin and sometimes metal people and put paint on them as a thing to do. So how did you come to this very strange hobby that we love? Uh, in a very unexpected way. So um, I know a lot of people out there probably started when they were, you know, in high school or around that age and found maybe Dungeons and Dragons or Warhammer and got into it when they were kids. I n knew that Dungeons and Dragons existed when I was in high school, but um, I was firmly in the uh, jock Proud. I was always into sports and I was into um, Army ROTC in high school and in college and everything. So like getting into nerdy stuff was really not on my radar. It wasn't until I went to university and I started dating a guy. And um, at first, you know, it was just like casually dating and he just set up the boundary that every weekend he would have a guy's night where he would go and hang out with his friends and they would do things together and that was just not to be infringed upon basically that was his time that he needed during the week mm -hmm. this and sounds very then, familiar to me <laughs> yeah and, and i'm like you know that's cool that's fine like i've got schoolwork that has to get done so i'm not too worried about like letting him have you know a night a week um to go do whatever he wants so that was fine by me. And then it was about a month into dating that he decided that we needed to have a really serious conversation. And he sent the request to me, like, through text. He's like, hey, can you come to my house after class? And we need to talk. And, of course, you know, I'm sitting there in the middle of class, like, freaking out about what it is that we need to talk about, thinking he's going to break up with me. And so I just said that over the text. I said, well, if you just want to break up, like, let's do it now and not, you know, worry about it later. And he's like, no, 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 it's not that. Just come on over. I just need to talk to you about something. So, of course, like, for the next hour and a half, I'm thinking it's the absolute worst. Like, he's got some horrible secret or some horrible thing that he has to tell me. And um, so, you know, I'm, like, preparing myself for the worst. And then I get over to his house, and he um, sits me down, and he proceeds to tell me that he plays this game with his friends every weekend, and it's a game called Dungeons and & Dragons. <laughs> and I was like... Okay, um, I was like, well, I don't really know anything about it other than it, it exists and it's what the nerds in high school played and that was about all my experience with it. And so I asked him what it was about and he uh, thought he was being punked there for a minute and um, he didn't really know how to respond to a girl being interested in his hobby. So uh, once he recovered from that, he proceeded to show me all his miniatures, modules, the monster manuals. He had all of the, like, you know, from the very first edition of um, Dungeons and Dragons, and he had his gray box set still, and he pulled all that out, and it was what we did for the rest of the night. He just showed me Dungeons and Dragons and miniatures. And then I expressed interest in going to um, his game just to meet his friends and see what the game was all about and sure. kind of get a better understanding. 
And uh, from there, I saw some really awesome minis and really cool artwork in the um, third edition of the Dungeons and Dragons books and um, just got hooked and thought it was the coolest thing ever. And um, I, once I got into miniature painting, I've, I've described this to a few people, but it's like the activity that I always knew that I wanted without never knowing it existed. Sure. Like I'd always been fascinated by small things, doll houses, you know, putting model kits together, which my dad encouraged. He would buy me model rockets and cars and things like that. And that's what we do on rainy afternoons. Um, so I always had an interest in, in things like miniature painting, but miniature painting was really what the activity that I had always, always wanted to do without knowing it. Um, so when I found it, it was just like finding a piece of my soul, essentially. That's awesome. That's so wonderful. Uh, I And I, you know, it's very funny, like there's so many echoes of that story for me, but from the other side of the equation, I will say... Uh, because as somebody who was, uh, certainly a nerd in high school and certainly played D and D throughout high school and in college and had that night where I told my, uh, my now wife, I was like, look, this night, this is it. This is, this is a sacred night. This doesn't get interrupted. And by the way, that's still true 20 years later with my wife. So she's clearly a saint. Um, but the, that's a, that's a really interesting inroad because you, you had this obvious, uh, connection to it so quickly. Were you into, did you ever do any kind of art, you know, or did you have any artistic training or did you do art in high school or, you know, anything like that beforehand? Or was it just like, this was literally kind of the first artistic big expression? Um, I always like to draw and do arts and crafts and things like that growing up. And, um, I'm the oldest of five kids. So, uh, whatever my parents could, you know, do relatively on the cheap to entertain us was good. And arts and crafts was always one of those things because all you needed was a ream of paper and some crayons and the kids would be set for hours. Um, and that seemed to hold true all through high school for me. Like I was encouraged to keep a sketchbook and doodle and um, did art classes and stuff like that through high school. But um, when I expressed an interest in becoming an artist and going to art school in university, that's when I was discouraged from it. And I was told it was an impractical profession and I'd be a starving artist for the rest of my life. And it's really hard and it's really competitive and you'll never be as successful as you want to be. And it's just a pipe dream and you should never do anything in the art field. And um, that I found a little bit soul destroying and Unfortunately, you know, my parents put the contingency on my education that if I wanted them to help me pay for my education, then I needed to do something that they approved of. So sure. I, kind of, I kind of abandoned art at that point and um, went in for some reason. They thought anthropology and studying archaeology was far more practical than art. Still not sure why. Well, because you, can, you yeah. can become Indiana Jones and that obviously pays very well. He seems to live well, a nice lifestyle. But, my mom's argument was that you could always become a professor, you know, so you could go in and get your PhD and then you could get funding to do research during half of the year and then funding to do excavation during half the year, which she is correct. Like that's how it works for how it can work. Um, but it's, I would say, an even more competitive field than getting into art is like it's sure. super cutthroat. Um, so yeah, so I guess I had this, this craving and desire to do art when I found miniature painting because I had otherwise abandoned everything else that I was interested in because that's what the adults in my life were telling me to do. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, that makes sense. So you find miniature painting. Now, what's interesting is coming in through D and D I would imagine like the miniatures that uh, your then boyfriend had, and probably that you were that you got into painting initially were more character based, right? Or maybe some monsters here and there, but more kind of like single figure stuff. So you didn't have the army track, right? Of like, I, I am somebody who's going to paint 150 figs to even play this game. You were sort of more bespoke, right? One, one, one yeah. at a time. The only army painting I have done has been for Privateer Press, and that's still on a you know model by model basis essentially when you're a um, staff painter like that but otherwise i i mean i've painted two convergence armies when it was released um from privateer and that's, that's pretty much it that's the extent of my my army painting otherwise everything has been either 
monsters, you know, a couple of character models here and there at a time for people. Um, that's, that's how I, I got into it. And I quickly found my footing with miniature painting to the point where like people at the local game store were starting to ask me if I'd paint their characters for them. And, you know, being a starving student, um, I was like, yeah, sure. If I can make an extra 50 bucks a week, that's groceries right there. So, right, right. But I did. <laughs> nice. Nice. So do you think that informed some of your journey as it went on? Because I think when I know for myself, when, you know, starting as like an army person, because I came in through Warhammer itself. So when you, I had to paint a whole bunch of stuff, you, you're and speed is what you're always going for, right? When you're an army painter. Do you think you coming into single figures, you, like from the start being this, set your expectations differently? Like you didn't have to reset your expectations to go, I'm going to spend a couple hours or 10 hours or 20 hours or X amount of time on this single mini. Like, do you think that reset expectations for you from the beginning or did you still train the endurance muscle all the same over time? No, yeah, I still train the endurance muscle only because I was like a full-time university student and also working part-time when I found miniature painting. So I didn't have a whole lot of time to spend and um, I used miniature painting sort of as my carrot. You know, like, I, so I made sure that I got my studies done, my chores done, went to work, all that. And then that was when I'd break out my paints and my miniatures and put something like Lord of the Rings on in the background. And um, I, you, some people might find this funny. I, I'm pretty sure that there's a few people out there that can relate to this. Um, when you have the Lord of the Rings extended edition, you know roughly the length of each DVD. So <laughs> I would time my miniature painting sessions by the length of the DVD. That's awesome. So you got, so you got one session is uh, is fellowship, and one session is two towers, and then one for Return of the King. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, pretty much. So, um, and when I first, um, I, so people often say miniature painters must be very patient people um, because of what we do. And anyone who knows me personally knows that I am not a very patient person. And so that's something that I've had to sort of train um, is to become patient with miniature painting over the couple of decades I've been doing it. So when I first started, I still was like, okay, well, I only have, you know, three hours to paint. So I need to finish this many in three hours. And so I did start by just I mean, similarly, painting to army painters without knowing it was there was a fixed amount of time. I had to get it done that amount of time. So I, I became very quick at painting. And then I noticed that my quality was improving after I got the speed down. Gotcha. Okay. No, that makes sense. So I'm interested then in the sort of journey to uh, the journey into working for P3. And, you know, like how, how did that, where did that arc happen? What, where did that, ha where did that occur? It happened over a few years, um, and I guess I have to thank global financial crisis for me being a professional miniature painter, because that's pretty much what made the decision for me. Um, after university, I went and worked as an academic counselor for University of Phoenix, which if anyone was a student at University of Phoenix, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> they don't have the best reputation these days, and they didn't even when I was working for them, but it paid the bills, and that's what you did. Um, I ended up getting let go from that job during the financial crisis when they had to pare down their staff, and I was living in Texas at the time, which was where I was working for University of Phoenix, and I just happened to have a house that was about two miles from the Reaper factory, and so when I lost my job, um, I just started looking for anything. And Reaper, uh, they needed a couple extra bodies because they had a contract come through to do some limited edition figures for, I think it was a, um, a video game. And uh, so they taught me how to cast miniatures and um, I did a good enough job. And they had somebody quit while I was there that they hired me on as a caster. And then that turned into being a caster and just a general warehouse monkey doing quality control and packing and shipping out orders and basically doing everything uh, on the factory floor other than working with the paint. And since I was working for them in that capacity, if they needed something painted up really quickly, um, oftentimes overnight, then I would stay up all night and get things painted for them so that they could have a release the next day. And so it was just, I don't know, I was there for a year. 
two, maybe. I can't remember. It all went so quickly. And then I ended up finding out about um, Privateer wanting to hire another painter. And I just heard about through the great client. I think it was Jason Weeby who actually contacted me, and he knew of the opening and to get in touch with um, them and submit my portfolio and you know see how it went. And so that's what I did. And I was persistent about following up the contact with Privateer. And after I had the interview and everything, and they um, eventually offered me a job. And I don't think they were expecting me to say, "Great, I'll be there in two weeks." because um, they were expecting me to you know, have to have time to pack up my house and sell it and do all that in order to move to Seattle. But um, yeah, I basically sold everything I owned other than what I could fit in my car and uh, rented out my house and moved up there. Nice. Nice. Okay. So that's how I, that's how I got started at Privateer. And then it was two and a half years at Privateer before I had the opportunity to come to Australia, and that kind of set things in motion to um, forge out on my own. Gotcha. All right. Nice. And I do want to talk about the the Australian adventure. As you are an expat, you're in Australia right now, but uh, but obviously I think, you know, and you've been there a while, uh, and I, I would suspect you're not leaving anytime soon, given the ties you've got there. Uh, so... <laughs> But but what I want to understand here is so I want to think I want to just kind of talk about over this time period you're you did some painting there for Reaper you're painting for P3 um, I'm sure there's lots of other people and, and artists over here who I know also work for P3 and also were did work for Reaper and stuff who you were you were talking to and meeting with um, do you did you find yourself competing or anything like that during this time period or you know how do you how did you look at that. Yeah, so, I mean, if you're a professional painter and you want to be relevant, you have to compete, particularly in the American scene. Like, that is something that you have to do. Um, it's uh, so now, now that I'm living, living in a different um, culture, there are, you know, there are some differences that I've taken note of since moving here and with the way that the differences in the um, painting communities operate. And in the U.S., uh, I think it's just, more of a cultural thing that we kind of, um, you know, elevate anyone who's won awards. There's a certain level of prestige that we apply to them. Um, there's a bit of, you know, I guess because of the, the close uh, ties of Hollywood and everything and sort of celebrity worship we, that kind of spills out into miniature painting as well to a certain degree. And so I think that's why competing is such an important part of American paint, of the American painting community. Um, if you do want to be someone who is continually working on a commission level or on a studio level, then you need to go to competitions, you need to compete, you need to win awards, you need to have the accolades in order to continue to be relevant. Once you sort of stop that, you'll notice that, you know, you'll still have some fans that will always be there and, and will um, follow your journey no matter what. But then once you stop really competing, you sort of just go by the wayside a bit in terms of your general exposure within the community. Um, whereas here, that's not so much only because we don't really have that many competitions. And right now, like the one competition that uh, I go to every year, I am either organizing or judging. And so I tend not to compete. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you... You uh, and I, I want to talk about that. So let's talk about Australia. So you come to Australia, and what's your experience when you get down there? What 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 happened that trapped you in to that continent on the bottom of the world there? So I I was originally asked to come to Australia as a special guest by Jason Wagner, who was a um, press ganger for Privateer at the time, and he originally contacted me because we had chatted on the. Privateer forums a little bit, and he asked, "Would Privateer ever send anybody down to Australia as a special guest, or would he, or would they ever send, you know, a, a booth down to a convention?" And I explained that it was highly unlikely, just due to the cost um, involved with something like that. And you know, even though Privateer seems like a huge company, much like Reaper does, they're still, you know, like relatively small businesses, and, and um, so anything that has a high cost, like they really have to make sure that it's worth it for them. Um, and so even though I had sent that discouraging reply, I then followed up with, but there's nothing saying I can't take my vacation and come down and do something with the community there. 
So, you know, I only had two weeks of vacation at Privateers, and so I was like, well, I can come for a full two weeks, and, you know, I can come to um, CanCon and be a special guest, and then maybe I can do a class somewhere and just kind of recoup some of the costs. And um, he was all for organizing that, and then it quickly turned into, well, if you're coming, why don't you hit a couple of other cities? So I was asked to go to um, teach in Canberra, to teach in Adelaide. I think I also went to Brisbane. Sydney, and and then I was asked if I would also go to New Zealand before I went back. So a two-week trip quickly turned into a six-week trip, and when I did all the calculations, um, I was going to make my entire private care press salary in six weeks. So it seemed the right idea to um, leave private care at that time and to pursue teaching on my own and uh, to be able to have this opportunity to go to Australia and New Zealand for six weeks. Um, and while I was there, Mark, my husband, he and I had met each other on the Oz Painters Forum back in the day, and we had, you know, like knew who each other were and kind of kept in touch very, very casually through forum. Um, so when he heard that I was coming to CanCon, which was an hour away from where he grew up, he decided that he was going to come and hang out and meet me and see what I was all about because no American painter had ever come to Australia previously. Gotcha. And so he came and he um, uh, saw that I was doing a, a one-on-one -on -one with somebody at the convention and um, he interjected a few things. And um, then that was the beginning of everything, really. He, he didn't leave my table for the rest <laughs> of the weekend. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, so you stayed down there. You've been painting, you know, the whole time, still continuing. Uh, what, and, and obviously you took over uh, the Crystal Dragon at CanCon at some point, right? And yeah. how did you find running that? Because it was, I'll, I'll say this, obviously I know you didn't run it this last year. You actually did get a year where you got to paint a little and, and put something in there. But um, from everything, I, I was so impressed by that competition. It's amazing. The, the level the quality, just the way it's run, I thought it was fantastic. And obviously, I, I interviewed Trent, and he said, look, that's all full credit to Meg, who, who really took this up. So how, it, how did you find that, running that over the years? Um, so so the, the year that I was at CanCon was 2014, and um, I actually entered into the CanCon painting competition at the time because, you know, why not? Like, I'm just there as a special guest, and it cost me nothing extra really to enter. Um and I think there was maybe 14 entries for the entire competition. <laughs> and um, it was just so poorly organized and run. And I mean, even the organizers, I think, would have to admit that, you know, they just didn't really have the time or the knowledge of how to make it better. Um, because the guys who run CanCon are firmly like war gamers and D&D &D gamers and board gamers. Like painting is just something that they know happens within the hobby and they can appreciate to a certain degree. But they just have no idea how big penny competitions can actually be and how important they can be. So um, I uh, basically begged them to let me take it over, and it took some, you know, negotiations of how it was going to happen and what the expectations were going to be for the competition. And um, I had to sort of give in to some of their requests in order to have the majority of the competition run the way that I wanted it. So they um, originally had us on the uh, main game floor. So if you can, uh, you, you were there this year, you know how noisy it can be in the middle of the gaming hall. Yes. And um, they had us right in the middle of everything because they wanted to have maximum amount of exposure. They wanted everyone to see the really awesome painted minis. But unfortunately, that sort of took away the community aspect that I was going for because it was so noisy. Nobody could really talk. There wasn't, like, even though we had tables and spaces for people to come hang out, it just wasn't comfortable. The lighting was terrible. It was hot. Um, and so I, you know, we, we made the best of it, essentially. And the first year, we had um, 40 entries. And I believe we, we actually had categories the first year as well because that's what everyone wanted when I was asking what they wanted out of a painting competition. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, so, like, we had a fairly good turnout for our first year. Um, I wasn't expecting a whole lot. I was just hoping that we'd get, you know, more than, like, three people entering, which we did. 
And so it evolved over a couple of years. And finally, after the second year of being in the main game hall, I was able to um, to negotiate getting the space that we're in now, which is upstairs and away from everything. So it's better lit, it's quiet, it's the best air conditioned space for the whole weekend, which is very important because it's a weekend that is often, you know, over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, to have the best air conditioned space for painters is excellent. Um, and then it also just allowed it to grow into more of like a community and a club feel. Like to me, it feels like just a really awesome club hangout for a whole three day weekend. Um, which was what I wanted. I wanted it to be a space where people could come together, paint together, who don't normally get to see each other, but we all know each other online, um, share ideas, uh, get critiques off of each other, because no matter how good a painter you are, you can always learn from somebody else. Um, you know, and so I, my whole aim with the competition was to a create a competition that kind of filled the void when Golden Demon left because that used to be the one big annual get together for Australian painters and when that left sort of competition and display painting kind of went by the wayside gotcha. overall um, and a lot of people missed that but they felt and Mark is included in this he felt that he didn't really have anything to paint for so why paint and you know a lot of people have ended up turning to either video games or just doing more tabletop gaming and less painting so um so yeah it, i took on a lot of suggestions from people and took on a lot of criticisms from people and um kind of just evolved crystal dragon into what it was and i also took some of the experiences that i had when i went and competed and and was teaching in europe for a couple of years um I took the best parts of those shows and brought them back and incorporated them into Crystal Dragon. So um, I quickly realized that, you know, we were never going to be a competition that's going to have, you know, hundreds or thousands of entries. So I just do away with um, categories. And that way you're just looking at the quality of the painting. And if the quality of the painting is up to snuff, then you get an award. Um, I didn't want to have a first, second, and third place competition because I feel like that breeds a certain amount of unhealthy competition right? Um, as opposed to a cooperative competition. And we're such a small community here in Australia and also in New Zealand that um, it's more important for me to foster the friendly competition rather than the um, uncooperative type of competition. Makes total sense. No, and, and I agree. You can feel the difference. When it's in something like an open system, you know, which you went to, there's really much more. I, I, I because I, there's a couple, I, I go to a couple of different competitions here in the States, and some of them are top sort of three, and some of them are open system. And there really is a whole different feel to the open I, system. I, yeah, I definitely, I think so. And, you know, that's after what, 10 years of competing in the US where everything is pretty much just first, second, and third, and then going to um, some of the biggest competitions in Europe, which are all open competitions for the most part, and it's a huge difference. Like, all of the competitions I went to in Europe pretty much feel like just a gigantic party with a painting competition packed on the end of it. Like, <laughs> it's more about the community coming together and having a good time and having that camaraderie rather than, you know, actually one-upping each other and beating the pants off of each other, which is how I feel my experience were in the American um, competition scene was that, you know, everyone was sort of polite to each other, to their face, but then there was a whole lot of back talk and, you know, just general nastiness that went along with such highly competitive competition scene. Sure. Makes complete sense. All right. Mm -hmm. So uh, are you taking back over next year? Is, uh, is 2021, are you, are you running it again, the show again? So Trent, um, I brought Trent on a couple of years ago uh, when I started having some health problems and I just couldn't keep up with it. And it was stuff that I was just having trouble getting a doctor to diagnose. Um, so that I think was one of the best decisions I made though. He's really, really, really good at organizing things because that's essentially what he does for a living is he organizes things and people. Um, so Trent will always be involved with organizing the event, but um, Mark, Sebastian, and I are going to be back uh, as judges next year. So this was just our one year that we wanted to have a little bit of a break to allow ourselves time to um, paint entries. Unfortunately, 
or fortunately, depending on your viewpoint, um, Mark and I made the decision to buy a house. <laughs> year. And um, it's a hundred year old cottage. So it kind of needed a whole lot of work and our painting studio was kind of packed up for about seven months. So we didn't really have the opportunity to paint much of anything for the competitions. The couple of things I did paint before we had packed up our studio, I painted the competition just because. Um, but I was glad to see that Seb actually took the opportunity to not only paint something, but sculpt something. Yeah, and his piece was unreal. Yeah, it was it was fantastic. Yeah, unbelievable. Um, I still don't like for somebody who doesn't paint all that regularly anymore. I don't know how he can pull off a masterpiece like that. And he's like, yeah, it was nothing. It was it was fine. He's just so humble about everything. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of pieces uh, that are amazing and inspiring and masterpieces, I, how about we take a look at some of your work? All right. All right. Sounds good. So I'm going to go ahead and bring that up. So the the viewers can't see you anymore. They can only see your, your work here. Uh, yep. All right. So uh, we're going to start off here. We've got uh, – and, and I've seen this fig, although I, I will openly admit I don't remember his name – but it's the dwarven explorer type of guy. He's like going for his sort of his knife or his long yeah. uh, scimitar type weapon. Um, this is such a good, such a good fun piece. Like there's a lot of little details I want to draw the the viewers' attention to. Of course, the first thing that jumps out is the the wonderful uh, resin work and the sign and the wonderful weathering on the sign, where you can just see it saying "Keep out." Uh, but also the pants. I don't want the viewers to miss all that wonderful, beautiful, like, plaid detail in the pants. So, so freaking fantastic. Uh, so this is great. What what uh, what, what uh, brought you to this piece? Why did you want to do this one? What's the story behind it? So uh, this piece is called Random Encounter. And, like, that's the actual name of the model from Fair Miniatures. And um, I have used this model for the last couple of years in my beginner's classes. Um, as the class model, and so I've painted several renditions of him. And um, this particular incarnation was a class model, um, so that's what drew me to paint him. Um, the uh, the reason I use him as a class model is because he does have a lot of really good surfaces to try and paint throughout the weekend. So you know he's got basically plain clothes that you can paint with whatever texture you want. Um, areas where you can do lots of freehand. He's got that majestic beard for painting hair. He's got enough skin that you can, you know, work on painting skin. And then we still have metallics. So for me, that's what I'm looking for when I'm choosing a class miniature. It's just having a diversity of surfaces so we can try a bunch of different things in class. Um, <clears throat> now, since I have painted this many, so many different times, um, I tend to let the classes dictate what I paint. Okay. So, um, that's like, I'll ask them, you know, how do you want me to paint the pants? Or, you know, what kind of hair color do you guys want to see me paint? Like, what do you want me to demo, essentially? So um, that's how the uh, the color choices came about, essentially, was just letting the, I think I did this one, actually, it was in a private coaching, but again, that's a, that's still a class. Right. Um, I had two people that weekend, and um, so they chose some of the colors, and uh, I showed them that freehanding wasn't scary by doing the plaid on the pants, which is actually a lot simpler than people think it is. Um, and then from there, I was like, well, what am I gonna, what am I gonna base them with? And I'd already done one that was like next to a big tree and kind of looked, you know, happy and summery and just very nice. And so I thought I'd go kind of the opposite direction and go with something that felt a bit more swampy and dangerous. And it's, name is random encounter you know you never know right. what you're going to come across. right so, now, yeah so i just kind of i just kind of had fun when i did the base and just did something different that i hadn't done for a while nice no i like it i like that the bird is like looks like he's about to take off too you get the impression that like what he's reaching for his sword for and the bird about to take flight is all a very connected moment we're just on the precipice of here yep i dig it and i Obviously, there's something dangerous in the water with the keep out sign, so. There you go. Uh, I do have mm -hmm. to give a full thumbs up to the color choice as well. Uh, purple and uh, sort of cyan, teal, whatever we want to call that. 
is uh you know right there that's that's uh that's my wheelhouse i love what you i love what you're doing there i also love the naturalistic color of his outer cloak right because he is out in the wilderness out in the this place where he'd want something that's much more natural colored but i love that he's still bright you know he's got he's got a bright personality he likes some 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 uh some kicking clothes but he's not foolish he still wears like something nature oriented for his outer cloak it's great yeah yeah, he's he's a little flamboyant, but he he realizes that he still needs to have some camouflage in order to blend in with his surroundings. But as you were alluding to earlier, there are colors in the base, like with the colors of the mushrooms and some of the foliage, that even his clothes that he's wearing that might seem a bit flamboyant or brightly colored, they still fit with his environment. Absolutely. Yeah, I love it. It's great. It's a, it's a really good example because the purple, obviously, purple can often be an intense color, but the extra elements on the base really help to balance it out, spread it around, not to mention up in the bedroll on his back, which also has some of that purple hidden in there. So it's it's really wonderful. I, I like it. Okay. All right. So next up, uh, this is Ariel, I think, is the name of the miniature. And uh, I've seen... Uh, this is a pretty uh, uh, popular miniature for lots of people to do renditions of, but this one's really, really impressive. Just the plinth and the background and how you've integrated everything together here, I think is absolutely magnificent. So uh, tell us, yeah, t tell us the story behind this one. I especially want to know where did we get the background piece? Like where did that, the sort of octopus's garden piece that's on the window in the back uh come from like what how where did you come to this because this is just such a cool creation okay so this piece is, is one of my favorites that i've ever done um for a number of different reasons so sebastian archer who obviously i'm friends with he sculpted ariel um and he when i said i wanted to paint this piece he said that he had seen lots of different people paint it but he had never seen anyone paint it with the traditional disney colors for Ariel. So I went with it. And I just happened to grow up, you know, when the Little Mermaid was all the hotness and um, have a soft spot in my heart for Ariel. Sure. And so it was just a sort of natural, um, a natural process, I guess, to, to use those colors and to come up with a more modern day story for her. Um, so that's, that's the reason for the color choices on the model itself was it's the classic Disney aerial color scheme, but modernized a little bit. And then, um, so I figured, well, if I have Ariel and she, you know, she has a weapon in her hand and she looks like she's about to do something pretty badass, like getting ready for a pose and maybe stretching out a little before she's about to go on the attack. She obviously has to have, you know, some sort of enemy. So, um, I decided that instead of trying to put an enemy on the base, itself like next to her that I needed to have something a bit more dramatic and so I decided that I was going to freehand the octopus on the base and the octopus being Ursula nice nice no I love it it's so it's so creative too because the the plinth is off it is black often plinths are black right as it is here when they're not just naturalistic wood and it feels like it's suddenly like when you put the octopus in there, it feels like it's just deep sea, right? It's down in darkness away from the light. And we've got the, the octopus reaching up and, and even crossing out into sort of reality there uh, yeah. on the edge of the base, which is amazing. Yeah. So um, so also the, <clears throat> the color scheme for the base itself came from um, the Little Mermaid movie as well and you know when she's in eric's kingdom and everything is so brightly colored and sunshine everywhere and so i took the colors from those scenes as inspiration for the colors for the sort of aerial secret garden as you put it and thought about you know what would it look like if i were to just take a little slice of maybe a public garden yep. out of the kingdom and um put her in it so uh the the piece uh the window piece that um you were asking about that's actually just a jewelry medallion from michael's craft store oh uh, nice yep. jewelry can come in very handy i have a whole box of beads and different um, pendants and things like this because you never know what you could use them for um and then otherwise it's just a piece of plastic card that it's been um glued to and i used uh spackle to create the texture nice 
That's awesome. I, I love like repurpose like that because it doesn't, it does not feel like that. That feels such a distinct, like set piece of this world. Um, it doesn't, so it like, it doesn't feel like that's what it originally was something else. That's great. How well it's all integrated. And I think that's what I like about this. The positioning of it is really, uh, is really strong too. Just the compositional elements of where, um, Ariel isn't centered, right? She's off center some, and that gives the octopus a lot more space, the holes and sort of the holes in the base as it were. Um, I just, I really love the, the way that the lines in this piece work between where the octopus tentacles are reaching up. And then where she like the sort of slightly contrapposto position she's in, and then the way the mirror or the window connects to that, I just it really flows well. Thanks. Uh, awesome. Okay. Well, this set's super cool, and it's so funny too because I hadn't connected that it was Ariel's actual colors right until <laughs> you said it, and then I was like, "Of course it. Is. That's why it like that's." But it clicked like when I saw it, I was like, "It just resonated." You know, the colors worked and then as soon as you said that i was like up oh, that's there you go boom it was it was appealing yeah. into my childhood disney brain and i didn't yeah. even realize it <laughs> I, I honestly i think that's why this piece is a favorite for so many people even if they may not realize it like you is that it does harken back to our childhood like you know so there was such a important film in my life i love i've always loved the little mermaid story even the actual traditional really sad depressing one right <laughs> I, I've always loved it, um, and and yeah, so it was just kind of a like I said a natural piece to come up with, and one that I had a lot of fun with, and um, I definitely learned a lot doing this piece. I want to say this was one of the first pieces I did after leaving Privateer Press, where I was just about to leave, um, and I did this piece specifically for a Decathlon one year. Oh, okay, got it. Awesome. Uh, okay. So, uh, next up, we have our, this is a pretty recent one, I think. This is our, our yeah. dwarven female fighter with her two axes. I, I was uh, lucky enough to see this one in person down at, uh, at CanCon. So, uh, yeah, take us through this, uh, this, this badass girl here. So, um, since we talked earlier about how I didn't start on the wargaming side of things, I started with, you know, Dungeons and & Dragons and um, doing character minis and stuff. Um, so for me, Reaper is to me what Space Marines is to a lot of people. <laughs> um, it's my bit of nostalgia. It's the, it's the Reaper minis are what I tend to go back to when I just want something kind of fun to paint and not worry too much about what, what I'm doing or coming up with the next, you know, masterpiece in the world. Right. Um, so that's what this one was. And I had converted it a long time ago to actually go on to another um, composition, which I've, you know, it's still kicking about, maybe one day I'll get to it, but it's a pretty big one. Um, but I just wanted to sit down and paint and paint something that I knew I was comfortable with. And I painted this miniature previously um, on a different incarnation. And so I just, yeah, just picked it up again. And at this time I had been playing um, a lot of Skyrim. Skyrim is one of my, I guess, hobbies you could say in that I so seriously mod Skyrim um, that it's almost a completely different game <laughs> in the way that it looks and it, and, and it plays. And um, so I had been playing in Skyrim and in the area called Markarth, which is like the Dwarven city. And so I guess I took some elements from that as my inspiration, specifically when I was creating the base and trying to come up with something simple yet um, looks like I've been there for a while and had vegetation growing over it because that's essentially like the area of Markarth used to be inhabited by the dwarves of Skyrim, but now it's taken over by humans. Gotcha. So, yeah, that was the inspiration for this piece. And then otherwise, it was just, it was just doing something fun and a little different. No, it's so fantastic because... So one of the things that I think really resonates, and actually our viewers can see it on on both of the pieces that... Um, I have of yours up on screen right now in the in the dwarf and in the original nightingale that that we taught that I've had up the whole time is yeah. you do such a wonderful job with skin tones and working in a lot of soft uh, gentle colors of hues of like magenta and these purple tones and the yellow tones of light it all feels very naturalistic and the skin that you create uh, you can see it on both of these these figures is really so naturalistic and yet striking. And I think this girl, like her face just is absolutely the center of attention here. 
Um, you know, that's often a big focus. A lot of times I find myself giving feedback to people saying like, you don't really, you're not really drawing attention to the face. And here it's just, you can't help but look away between her eyes, which are so amazing and blue. And like, I'm actually going to zoom in here for our viewers on this because they're so unbelievably bright and, uh, and the face and the way the lighting set up, I just think it's absolutely wonderful how, how you do that. So is, is that kind of, is working the skin tone a fun step for you? Do you like working in these kinds of, uh, of colors and stuff like that? Cause I think you do a really good job with it. Is it something you enjoy? I, yeah. So painting skin and faces and hair has always been something that is a lot of fun for me and also metallics. That's something else I like to do. True metallic. Um, and so those are the areas where I think I tend to shine on models, um, because I enjoy painting it so much. It's just, it's, it's a part of the, you know, it's the relaxing part of the painting process is when I can really sort of just zen out and, um, I don't really even have to think about what I'm doing anymore and haven't for many years. I just kind of go into autopilot and just sit, listen to my audio book and paint. Um, but like you, I often give people the feedback, whether it's in class or, you know, after I've judged Crystal Dragon, um, that the focus hasn't been brought to the face enough. And, and in classes, I point out that a lot of times, you know, people will um, not think about how they're highlighting and shading correctly. And so you can end up having uh, areas on minis like the boots, for instance, which might be as brightly highlighted as the face. Right. But you know, maybe a different color. So uh, that's where your eye ends up being dragged to. And so you want to make sure that you're not doing that. You always want the attention to come to the face, not to the boobies, not to the butt, not to the feet, not, you know, nothing like that. You want it to be on the face first because that's where we as human beings are, you know, that's where we want to look naturally is we want to look at faces and then work our way down the model. So, um, so I do, tend to spend a time on the face and um, in particular the eyes that's really important um, I do want to point out really quickly for anyone who's wondering what scale this is this is a 28 millimeter scale model and it is a dwarf so it is actually shorter than 28 millimeters um, and I still managed to get eye color and an iris and a reflective dot in there so there's there's only to a certain point that eyes are too small to get a lot of information into. Um, but a lot of the Reaper figures, and particularly things sculpted by Werner Klopp, which this one is, um, he has really great eyes, and you can get a lot of information and detail in them, which helps give the character more of a personal feel. Yeah. No, it, it does. It does. And, and the, the eyes are really so nicely shaped on this. And you're right on a lot of the Reaper minis. So that's it, it gives you actual space to work with. And it's it's the window to the soul for a reason like human beings naturally not only want to look at faces but we want to meet eye to eye right like that's one of our sort of defining things how we know we're looking at someone and if you're looking at me then there's this sort of immediate trust established you're not a predator you know it's that kind of thing it's somewhere buried deep in our uh our dna right so when we when you have eyes that are very colorful they're very grabbing it just makes the miniature sing so yep yep yeah. And I will um, say that when I teach how to paint eyes, I often tell people that um, no matter what the eye color is that you want to go for, you cannot go for an ultra realistic color unless we're working in a much larger scale. So for me, anything that's like 25 to 54 millimeter, I always make my eye color much, much brighter than they actually would be if they were a real eye color in real life. That way you can still see it because the eyes are so so tiny that if I were to actually put like a realistic blue color in her eye, it just wouldn't read properly. It wouldn't read as blue. It would just read as a as a dark eye. Right. Yep. Hundred percent. Uh. All right. Awesome. Uh. So next up we have the flower knight. So uh, tell us yep. about about this this. Uh, obviously, the flower knight is. I'm sure people have seen. Uh, versions of this miniature around because this is such a wonderful, striking figure. And uh, yours here is just surrounded by this, these wonderful bright colors that, that culminate in the eyes of the night itself with that almost fluorescent green, frankly, right? Uh, so yeah. so talk about this one. Um, so this is a piece that I did for competition. Um, it was for Gen Con. I think the last one of the last Gen Cons I went to, actually. And um, it was at a time when I had done only a little bit of freehand. I hadn't really done a whole lot of it. 
um, only because at this point in time it, it had kind of intimidated me and um, there were so many great American painters that were awesome at freehand, Mariko Reimer being one of them, that um, I always, you know, felt like I just, if, if I tried to do it, I would never be up to snuff. Um, but one of the benefits of uh, moving to Seattle for Privateer Press was that I was now within um, driving distance of Marika Reimer, and she started inviting me and a few other local painters to come to her house for hangouts. And um, I had asked her one day, I said, so, you know, like, how, how do you come up with your freehand patterns? Like, they're always so intricate, and they always look amazing and perfect. And I'm like, how do you do it? Like, what is your process? And I kid you not, her answer was, um, I don't know. I just think of everything as squiggles and dots. Yep, yep. And I'm like, okay, all right. We're just going to go with the simple answer. Excellent. And so I, you know, picked her brain just a little bit more. And then um, while I was at her house, I had a different mini with me, one to practice on. I started trying to map out a pattern with squiggles and dots. And her trick that she told me, um, which really made a lot of sense once I thought about it was that you only paint the full pattern a couple of times on the model. And then otherwise the rest of the negative space that's left, you paint literal squiggles and dots. And as long as the squiggles and dots are in ordered in such a way that it can relate to the full pattern that you painted, then your brain will fill in that information as being a repeating pattern. Yep. It's just the visual confusion will just, your brain will make it work. Right. I did. So, um, so that's, that was essentially one of the things that I did with this model was on all of the slashed um, fabric, there is actually a repeating pattern, but the pattern is probably only fully painted about six or seven times on the model itself, and then the rest is just squiggles and dots. But it helps make it look like it was a brocade sort of fabric. And um, so this model for me in particular was an exercise in trying to make different surfaces look like different materials. Right. So I didn't want all of the fabric to look the same. I wanted the metallics to have a different color and shine quality than what you normally see. Um, uh, so that, that's where I pushed myself with this. And then he's holding a butterfly in his hand, and um, that's where the idea for the butterfly on the base came from, was um, to have, you know, the glowing butterfly in his hand. And then, well, is he uh, – the story is kind of ambiguous. It's whatever you want it to be, essentially. But I just thought it would look really cool to have – to think of him in, like, this dark forest setting – where um, you know he walks into a clearing and maybe there's some ruins and stuff. That's why there's some of the um, uh, uh, tiles and stuff on the base. And then to have these glowing butterflies, like he's just walked into that butterfly sanctuary essentially, and he's connecting to them somehow. He's like a nature spirit or a nature guardian. Yeah, I love it. Can, can we talk about the the armor versus the sword a little bit? So, so you are, uh, truly my great inspiration in working with true metallic metals. You mentioned it, uh, already. And I know that I spent a lot of time reading your blog back in the day and trying my best to understand everything you were saying and practicing and practicing and practicing because you always imported the lessons of non-metallic metal into true metallic metal and taking control of the light and doing that sort of thing. Right. Where you you using metal paints, but in a very sort of, I think, certainly what even to this day is still a non-standard way. Right. Uh, in working in other colors. Um, yeah. So, again, this is, this is something that's been informed by my experiences in the American painting competition scene. So when I was competing, the main things that were important to have on every entry you ever put into a competition was you needed to have really awesomely painted skin and, and usually a scantily clad female figure of some sort was probably your best choice to go with. That way you could also showcase some freehand, whether it be a tattoo or if she had clothes, you know, you did a repeating pattern somewhere. And then you needed to have non-metallic metals because non-metallic metals are the best. It's the ultimate. It's it showcases your ability as a painter. It's the thing that you must learn and you must do. And, you know, like these were some pretty stringent, like rules. They were just never generally accepted. Like, um, I wouldn't say that they were ever 
officially put into you know print or anything but it was just something that was just widely discussed at the competition scene at that time yep and um, i learned to paint on metallic metals and i didn't really like the process myself and i didn't really like the way it looked in the end um because no matter how i painted and this was back in the day when um, all metallic metals really kind of came out pretty cartoony um as, you know, things have changed now. There's awesome non-metallic metal work that's going on in the community that I just don't even know how people are achieving. I would love to take lessons with, like, Land Studio and Carol and all of the awesome non-metallic painters. Um, but, you know, for me at the time, it wasn't a process I enjoyed, and I didn't think that it really looked like metallic, and I felt that it looked a bit too close to my skin tones or my... Um, fabrics in terms of the finish of the material right so i always kind of stuck with true metallics because that at least looked like it was a different material than anything else on the miniature and i didn't really see a problem in marrying the two like if you like really really if you paint one you can paint the other it's just whatever you're comfortable with so i can paint non-metallic metal i just don't think that or I don't like what I come out with when I paint it, as right. opposed to when I paint true metallics. So I paint true metallics, but I still shade them with non-metallic paint, and I highlight them with just little bits of brighter colored metallic paint. Um, but you can glaze in whatever colors you want into your metallics. You can even mix in ink to tint your metallics if you want to get a different metallic surface. Um, the armor on the flower knight in particular is actually a color shifting pigment that I then suspended in a gloss coat and painted it on and then just treated it like it was a metallic paint. Right. It came out wonderfully. So, it's it, like because it just it feels copper, bronze, you know, it's 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 so much in that space and it just it reads as that like 100 percent. It reads as that period. Boom. Yep. So, yeah, so it's. It, it, I don't really see, like, I, know, I guess it's a controversial topic, you know, there's, there's still such a divide about whether non-metallics are better than true metallics, but I don't really see an issue with accepting both. Right. Like, I, I don't understand why there's a division within the community. I think we should accept um, any technique as valid, any way that you want to put your paint on your mini as valid, um, as long as it reads as you want it to read. Like, that's the most important part of the execution. If you could put metallic paint down on anything, but if it doesn't read as a metallic surface, then, or a well executed metallic surface, then, you know, you still need to go back and practice whatever you're doing, whether that's using metallic paint, using non metallic paint to try and convey that something is a metal surface. 100% agree. 110% agree. <laughs> All of the agreement. Uh, yeah, let the division so, die. That's what I say. Like, it's, it's, yeah, it's. Like, and, and I'm just going to say here, you're, for all of you guys watching out there, you're hearing this from somebody who is a judge and has been a judge for the last, you know, five, six years of my life. I, I, if I see true metallics on an entry, I don't view it as being any less than something that has non metallics. You know, both are equally valid, and it just depends on whatever you like, whatever you're comfortable with. And I even saw a question recently, you know, is there anything saying that you can't use non-metallic and true metallic on the same model? And the short answer is no. There's nothing saying that you can't use both on a single model. You just have to make sure that you execute both so well that none of it looks out of place. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Next up, we have uh, a very, very fancy lad, this guy. Uh, so this is Lancelot, I believe. He's our, our steampunk duelist knight. I, I love everything about this guy. Like, this guy is dapper. Uh, this is such a great figure. Where did this come from, by the way? Okay, so this is another Sebastian Archer figure. He sculpted it, and it's for his um, twisted game that he has developed over the last, I don't know how many years now, six, seven years. Um, and he, when I first moved over to Australia, he asked me to do some of the box art for him. And, um, so I, this is one of the pieces that I did. And unfortunately, uh, from, from memory, I think Seb said he kind of got smashed up in transit a bit. Aww. Even though, I know, even though we live two hours apart, somehow Australia Post managed to completely mangle and destroy, um, the things that I sent back. So 
some of it, so this piece is really kind of a collaboration between Seb and I, because he ended up having to put it back together and then touch up a few areas of it. Gotcha. Um, but, but I love the way that it came out between the two of us working on it. And um, it is one of my favorite pieces. And I do still have another copy of this to do for myself, as well as his larger scale Lancelot that he did um, a year or two ago um, that you can get now. And uh, yeah, it's just, it, it's just a fun piece. It was the first time I had really painted anything that was like so truly steampunk. Right. Um, you know, like, because privateer likes to say that their models are kind of steampunky, and to a certain degree they are, but this guy just kind of screams like classical Victorian steampunk to me. Like, it's, it's, what I imagine, like, I could, I could easily imagine this guy being cosplayed at any steampunk convention, essentially. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. I that is very accurate. Yes, <laughs> yeah. like, it, it just feels like something that is quintessential steampunk. So it was just a lot of fun. And then again, I you know I like metallic work, and this a lot of him was metallic work, and I wanted to really showcase that metallics are you know, true. Metallics are a valid um, technique. It's a valid paint to use. There's nothing saying that you can't use it, whether it's box art, competition, whatever. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's more or less the story of this piece. He's just, yeah, he's just one of my favorites. I just love his, his jaunty little pose there. He's just so casually, like, are you sure you want to say that? Like, come yeah. at me, bro. Like, let's, let's fight. Let's do this. He seems so relaxed about it, right? Like kind of the position of his wrist with the sword. He doesn't feel threatened, right? That's what no. you get. There's such a yeah, confidence yeah. to him. Pretty much, yeah. He's just so sure in his abilities that he's going to totally mess whoever it is on the other end of that sword up. That he's just like, yeah, okay, let's do this. Whatever. It'll entertain me for five minutes. <laughs> yeah. And and so there's a, there's a couple things I really want to draw the audience's attention to because I think they're so cool on this mini. And the first thing is just your execution on the purple of his uh, interior vest. Because the the highlights and your your color use on it is so masterfully perfect, it feels like silk. Like I assume that's what you were going for, because it just reads as like this perfect silky vest that he has on. That's so yeah. like very classy. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going for. So I wanted the um, vest to look a bit different than the pants. You know, so I wanted the pants to look a bit more uh, like they were a thicker or rougher fabric, and yep. then his. Um, his vest, I really wanted to make it feel like it was a slick, satiny, silky fabric. Um, and I, I think that was pretty well achieved. I, I was pretty happy with the result. <laughs> yeah, 100%. The other thing that I, I, I want to call all the audience's attention to, because this is another thing that I talk about all the time, that, like you shouldn't be scared of bright colors you just need to make sure that when you use them you're using them intentionally balancing them where you can or drawing attention to something where you're you know you're you're using it to draw attention to a space you want attention in and i think that's a story of of your your bright blue here very much so where he has this uh i don't know what you call that his little neckerchief or whatever it is that's in this wonderful bright blue what is it a cravat i guess a, a, a tie you're right cravat, cravat. It's totally a cravat. Yeah. It's 100% a cravat, yes. So he has his bright blue cravat, and one that's drawing attention up toward his face. Because one of the challenges with this figure is obviously his face is very blocked, right? He has this big sort of mask on. But still, again, yeah. you put a nice bright edge on that, so that's still the brightest point. But the blue naturally draws the eye because it's such a stark color, and yet it's, it itself is a little arrow pushing us up to that. But it's also in balance where the sword line has a bit of that bright blue. And again, the line that the sword's creating is pointing us right back at the face through that bright blue and then balanced with a little bit of that blue glow on the OSL of something in his in his little adventurer's pack down there. So we've got our standard yeah. sort of triangle color balance and everything is bringing our attention right up to the face. That's it, yep. So that's an important thing. I don't know if you... Um talked about it i'm sure you have in one of your many videos you know the triangle of composition where you need to which can also be the circle of composition depending on which school you come from but essentially you need to have um a certain number of uh, points on any composition whether it's 2d or 3d that keep your eye moving around the piece so the fact that we do have those three bright blue 
spots on the model. It keeps your eye roaming around the important parts of the model and bringing it back to the face, which is what you constantly want to be bringing the attention back to. Yep. Um, I would also yeah. point out to all the viewers that all our areas of like really heavily saturated color are tended to be grouped here around the upper torso, the center of the model. Like it's that, that saturation is also drawing us in because you, you know, yep. your pants, you went this very, it's sort of a very desaturated light khaki color, the soft gray black uh, socks or whatever he has on like his fancy dapper shoes, even the ground cover you went, which is red, like he's on some kind of, you know, brick or stone or something like that. But even that is a very desaturated kind of red earth type of thing, like very, uh, cause red is obviously a very eye catching color, but it's so soft yeah. and you have green mixed in. So naturally then boom, we've got these two contrasting colors that kind of balance each other out and help the background, the base kind of fall into the background where it should be and makes the brighter pastel colors take all the attention up top. Yep. So yeah. really, really fantastic. I mean, just, I, I, I want to point all this out because it's, it's such a masterclass in composition on what's really not a, a very big figure. Right. And yet you're doing so much work here. Yeah. It's just, it's just a figure on a base, but you can make even just a figure on a, on a little gaming base. Interesting. You know, I feel like a lot of times people get hung up on um, like all really good competition models need to have these elaborate bases and um, need to have like this full story fleshed out. And I don't know, for me, I mean, maybe it's just because of the amount of um, campaigning I've done for people over the years and in studios and stuff that sometimes I just want to sit and paint a model. Like I don't necessarily want to come up with some elaborate story for it. I just want to paint for the sake of painting right. and maybe while I'm doing that, I'm trying to push some aspect of my painting, but I don't necessarily feel like you need to tell a story or you need to create a masterpiece every single time that you paint. You can literally paint for the enjoyment of just doing it. Um, and, you know, so you can, but then the, the trick is that if, if it is something that you like at the end and you want to keep as a display piece in your cabinet, or for me, I take to classes as examples, for people to look at and to handle, um, I still want it to look interesting. I don't want it to be a boring composition. So that's when you have to start thinking about your color composition rather than your structural composition. Absolutely. Yep. All right. Yeah. So next up, we have, I, I think most people are probably going to recognize this gentleman. Uh, we've got Magneto. He's up and floating. Uh, such an awesome, it's, 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 you're using like the floating metal effect here of the pieces really, really well. Like you just, you get hit the sense of power here right away. So uh, yeah. talk to us about Magneto. All right. So Magneto was actually a commission. Um, one of my friends who is also a sculptor for Privateer, he's still sculpting for Privateer. In fact, he's just doing it on a freelance basis now. Um, he, he asked if I would paint this because he always had, he had the kit and he always loved it and he wanted to have it in his, um, his nerd cave, probably on display and, you know, he's the comic book video game type collector and, and so this for him was something that he really wanted to, to have done nicely. And so, um, him being a sculptor, he offered to clean it and put together and all that because he had noticed that there were some issues with casting. So I was like, yeah, sure, that's fine. You clean it, you put it together, and then I'll paint it and enter it into um, Adepticon. And, uh, you know, we'll just we'll see how it goes from there. And it was a completely different genre <laughs> than I'm used to painting. Um, I, this was the first real comic book uh, piece that I'd ever done. Um, and I grew up with the X-Men cartoon, not necessarily the comics. So, I mean, I was familiar with, familiar with X-Men and um, the movies and all that stuff. So I knew who Magneto was, and he's always one of the characters that I actually liked, even though he's, I guess, a bad guy, <laughs> depending on your perspective. Uh, you know, it kind of comes and goes. He's, he's often yeah. a good guy, often a bad guy, often somewhere in between. That's fine. Right. I think uh, you know, it's a, I think Chris Claremont like had said that uh, when he started writing Magneto in the first couple issues he put Magneto into, he said that by issue 300, he knew Magneto was going to be like that is to say on issue like 20. He knew that by issue 300, Magneto was going to be leading the X-Men and be a good guy. Like he had that arc thought of that took 10 years, 12 years to get to. So it's a little both. Well, that, that's, that's good then. Anyway, so um, I... I 
Um, I actually didn't put the the um, plastic card on for the metal sheets and all that. That was that was Brian. He did that. That was one thing that he wanted to add to it because I think in the box art that had been painted, it showed something like um, you know the metal bit floating, or he had seen it. I think he'd seen it somewhere else. And um, anyway, so he wanted that to really convey like Magneto was floating and using his powers and, and add just a bit more drama. So that, that idea was all him. I just had a bunch of fun painting it. And then for me, the the aim of this was to try to um, take my style, which a lot of people have described as cartoony over the years, which I'm totally okay with. That's totally fine. It's, it, my style tends to be a bit more, I think, like graphic and um, like graphic design and, and brightly colored and, um, you know, cartoony uh, rather than realistic. Um, and so I wanted to take that and then still try to make it look a little bit more realistic so that it was like he was a comic character coming to life. Right. And I feel like I, I achieved that as best I could at the time because this was, uh, this would have been what the, not the last Adepticon I went to, but the second to last Adepticon I went to, I entered this in. Um, and I was right after I had, or right, at, right after I had left privateer. Yeah, it was the year after I had left privateer. And um, uh, yeah, it was just it was a, it was a, the biggest piece I had ever painted. Um, yeah, how big is this guy? He so this is seventy five millimeter scale. Okay. Um, but I'm pretty sure everything all up, he's probably closer to like ninety or ninety five because of the height of the cloak. Right. Like, I mean, it's huge. It's an absolutely huge thing. And so to go from, you know, painting 28 to 32 scale for the majority of my career and my days as a um, commission painter to doing something so huge like this, like it was just a huge, huge challenge. And the cloak in particular, I was so terrified of screwing the cloak up because like, if you don't get it right, you're really going to notice it. Right. <laughs> it's, it's such a huge part of the model. Um, so, and at this time, I didn't really know how to airbrush. So, this was the piece that I learned that I used to learn to airbrush. It's, um, <laughs> I can see that. I can absolutely see that. And and it was a big decision to go that way. It took a few tries to get it right. But in the end, I feel like this was probably the best result I could have achieved at the time with my skill set and um, my limited knowledge of airbrushing. Nice. So he's got in, in using his powers here. You've you've you know created this sort of bright blue OSL effect of him reaching out with the the magnetism, uh, and it yeah. looks like you've brought that over into the individual pieces of metal where his his power affecting each metal is causing a little bit of like blue glow onto each of them. Am I especially around the edges where that's being reflected out? Am I reading that yeah. correctly? Yeah, so the so the three major colors on the model, which is the red, the purple, and then the blue, there are hints of that in all of the metal pieces, um, and that's to I mean you know for compositional harmony a bit to make sure that there's color that there aren't just extraneous colors that are introduced into the composition, um, that everything makes sense, and then also to have that reflection of yes everything's being affected by him and his power and the metal is at his mercy essentially. Yeah. No, that's such an awesome touch. Like it's it's something that jumped out at me right away because I felt like it felt like they weren't just floating kind of to float, right? But that but that he was having a direct effect on them. It really connected him and the world around him in a very real way. So that's that's such yeah. a nice touch. Uh, this, uh, along with Ariel, this piece is often a fan favorite, and that's one I get asked about most often when I go to classes. Is do you still own Magneto? And if so, why didn't you bring him to class? <laughs> <laughs> so apparently, I need to paint another one at some point for myself, just so other people can see it. There you go. There you go. All right. Uh, have you ever? Let's let's. Let me pause on that real quick. If you were to tackle him now, you know, given where you're at, let's imagine you paint another one of these guys, right? What do you think you would do differently? Well, I do have another copy, and it is in my to be painted stash. Okay. Um, and I have to talk about that because do I just try and redo this color scheme and this idea just now with, you know, six, seven years down the road? Um, or do I try and go for something different? So I have toyed around with the idea of doing him as a dark magneto 
you know, where everything is blacks and grays and maybe some hints of blue and just keeping the whole composition pretty dark and sinister. So bad guy Magneto, not good guy Magneto. Right. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, it's one of those things that I haven't really settled on an idea. Nothing's really grabbed me when I have thought about it. So he's just tucked away since he's a model that you really can't get anymore. And he he's sitting there along with, um, I have Gambit and Black Cat and a couple others that I'd like to do at some point. Um, Gambit was always one of my favorites from the cartoon. I just always loved his his um, character design. So he's, he's one that I've had some... Uh, interesting ideas for and I have a feeling that if I were to pull Gambit out and tackle him then I might formulate some more um, strong opinions about what to do with Magneto. Gotcha. Look, if you didn't love Gambit in the cartoon, I don't know what's wrong with you, but you shouldn't be you shouldn't be hanging out on this channel. Let me just tell you that right now. Um, I tend to agree. He was he was literally one of my favorite characters, him and Rogue. So Absolutely. Yes. All right. Uh, and, and that that cartoon w left an indelible impression on all of us of a certain age cohort. There's no doubt. No doubt. Apparently. <laughs> that, is, that and Batman the Animated Series. Those are like my after school TV choices. Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, cool. So next up, we have uh, a bust. We've got uh, Sansa. Uh, so tell us about yeah. her. Um, so, so, a couple of years ago, I went over to Europe to teach, and while I was there, I also took advantage of having such amazing teachers at my fingertips that I wouldn't otherwise have. So I went and did a private coaching with Roman Lapot, and um, I wanted to learn more about his philosophy in regards to, you know, like using colors to create atmosphere and to um, really tell more of a story because he just does amazing things with his color choices and with his composition, and he's somebody that. I do um, really like seeing his work and his, whether it's his work in progress or his finished minis. And I like attitude as a miniature painter and, and the fact that he wants to have such a positive influence over the community. And he's done a lot for the community. So he's just somebody that I really, I really respect and I really appreciate his, um, his talent and also his attitude towards painting. And so uh, this was the first piece that I did after I got back, or no, not the first, the second piece I did after I got back from um, class with him. And so it was my first time where I really tried to utilize um, underpainting in order to create an atmospheric effect. So she was primed in black, and then I used my airbrush to create a gradient from like a dark navy blue up to a really, 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 really pale um, teal color okay. to reflect that she's like in a cold environment and um, you can really see hints of the blue kind of peeking out in places including in the hair um, which often blows people's minds <laughs> until I, I point it out and say like the hair itself is highlighted with a light blue not a yellow and then the skin tone has a lot of blue tones in it, and it's just a lot, um, while it still has warm colors in it and has the skin tones that I like to paint, it has a bit more of a cooler feeling to it than a lot of my other work has previously. So it was just a fun exercise in trying to um, think more about how I'm getting atmosphere in my pieces and how I am using that to tell a story. No, I, I, that absolutely reads. She feels like she's in such a cold environment. Right. Like it, it comes across. Uh, and I think the skin, again, just to go back to, you know, what we talked about earlier, I think there it's it's captured really well, especially when you look around her cheeks, her eyes, her neck. Right. Like it's just you feel that 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 color tone feels like it's in a cold environment in those spaces. It really, really sets the larger ambient. But then at the same time, the the highlights don't have that like warm yellow to them as much. Right. They're much more. Uh, desaturated, much more pushed into a cold light. Yep. So, um, yeah, that, that's pretty much the story with this piece. It was it was a fun one. Um, this one now resides in a private collection, and uh, I I kind of sometimes wish I still had it in my own collection. But again, as I said with Magneto, I guess I just have to paint another one for myself at some point. There you go. That's right. Okay. Uh, so let's stay on the Game of Thrones here, and uh, here up we've got a uh, Tywin Lannister. Uh, obviously, one of uh, this is one of my favorite characters from the show. I mean, you had to love Tywin. Come on, this guy was great. 
he's one of my favorite characters from the show and also from the book. So, I mean, I've, I haven't read the book. I've listened to the books probably about four or five times. And um, I enjoy all of the Lannisters. I, I just, I find each one of them to be um, just uh, interesting characters. I, I don't like, I definitely identify them as being um, more on the uh, bad end of the spectrum between, you know, good and bad, but they have some interesting motivations and neuroses and um, <laughs> they're just, they're, they're interesting characters. And Tywin, uh, I've always, um, found a bit interesting in the books and then I really really thought that like it was perfect casting for Charles Dance I couldn't imagine anybody else as Tywin now right oh absolutely so to, to be able to paint him as Tywin and really I took more of the um, book description of Tywin rather than the way he looks in the in the TV series um, and uh, applied the colors that way so I made him a bit more blonde than I think he looks in the um in the TV series, and then I went with the bright red because you know Lannister's red and gold, um, whereas I felt it went a little too muted in the TV show. Um, the story with this one, though, is that this was the first bust I have ever painted. This is this is bust number one. That's what I'm hearing here, right? This this, this is the first one. Number, this is the very first one, and um, I so when I was painting it, I had Game of Thrones on in the background, and then I also had a few um, pictures of Charles Dance printed out. So I was actually using the him as reference for painting it and trying to get um, a bunch of the different colors from the skin and also from the atmosphere. And, and this was before I did the atmosphere class. This was like years before. Um, but I was really trying to get everything that I was seeing in the images that I took of Charles Dance and apply it straight to the bust. And I feel like I did a pretty good job. And um, I was really pleased with the way his face came out in particular. Oh yeah. I mean it, it it looks like Charles Dance playing Tywin Lannister. I mean like it really does. It's it, and I can see the difference in the hair and and the beard, but nonetheless, so you talk about, you know, going to the book. But nonetheless, yeah. it's still which which reads perfectly fine to me actually. I think it reads really well set again. I think if that was more muted, I'm not sure it would be as good against like the red and and the gold and everything. Uh yeah. so, so I think it's actually a stronger composition with it that color choice. Yeah, I mean, I agree. And even with the um, other iterations that I've seen uh, of people painting this bust more like Charles Dance from the TV series, I always feel like there's just something quite not quite right with the color choices. And I think that's just because he is primarily like so fair haired in the TV series, but then he has such dark muted clothes and armor and everything. It just, he reads as almost too, too bland. Like right. he doesn't have enough going on he needs something and so i i don't know but i i like my bus the best out of all the renditions i've seen <laughs> but i do nothing so. wrong with that at all nothing wrong at all no this is truly great this this piece um was on my blog for quite a while when i before i moved it over to um my new website that i've had for a few years now and um it was how to paint red because people are always terrified of painting red, but for me, red is one of the easiest and most fun colors to paint, even though it's not my favorite color to paint. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to demystify the process of painting red, because um, a lot of people seem scared to let red go up to pink when you're highlighting it, like that's a huge no-no, you don't want it to go pink. But in my philosophy of painting red, you you shade down to a near black and then you highlight up to pretty much a pure white and you have this horrible level of contrast that just looks gross and disgusting. And then you go over it with red ink and it brings everything together. Right. So that's, I showed the step-by-step -step of this and I explained what I was doing as I was doing it. And I actually posted it on Arcane Paintworks on Facebook like day by day what I was doing every time I did an early step. And then I condensed it all into a blog, which unfortunately I have not been able to port over to my new website. So it's not there anymore. Um, but I remember the reactions when I was painting this, like people were like, okay, I'm like sure you think you know what you're doing, but I'm not convinced you actually know what you're doing. They were, <laughs> there's so many just kind of negative reactions of people just, 
holding their breath and, and watching how I was going to screw this up. And then when I put the red ink on and showed the process of how it all changed, I think it just blew a few people's minds. And because um, that's how you get such a high contrast but highly saturated red. Right. Is you really need to have an extreme level of contrast. And then when you put the red ink over the area, like you're putting it over everything, the highlight and the shadow, and it just brings everything together and brings that, that saturation back in that most people are looking for. A hundred percent. The exact same advice I give so often on how to get good highlights and good shadows into red. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, and that's not my technique of doing it. This has been published in many different books across the decades. And if anyone has the um, Hador or Scorn, uh, faction books and privateer that's that's how they paint right in the back of those books and the painting guide like that's that's the easiest one that i can think of to get a hold of but there's also you know like historical how to paint books and stuff like that that describe this this is an old old technique it's nothing new it's not fancy it's it's just the best way to get a highly saturated but high contrast red it's the easiest way yep absolutely agree yeah all right, so last up, we have uh, this figure. So this is our Valkyrie uh, woman on a, on, a, on a horse here. So tell us about this one. All right, this is Zora Beth, and um, this one was also painted for a Decepticon one year. And uh, it, it was the first time I had painted a horse of this size. Um, previous to this, I painted a horse, uh, a horse and a gazelle mount from the privateer uh, figures. Um, so I hadn't really had a whole lot of practice painting animals, but this one was definitely a, a bit of a challenge because this horse is, um, well, it's huge. Let, let me just say, if you threw this model at people because it is all metal, like you would definitely cave somebody's skull in. Like it's, it's <laughs> enormous. So this is a this is a deadly weapon in addition to a beautiful miniature is what I'm hearing here. It is. It is a deadly weapon. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, this was just trying a bunch of different things, again, on a scale that I wasn't really comfortable painting at this point in time. Because I, I, this was after I had painted Magneto. I think this is like this, the direct, the next project that I did right after Magneto. Um, and so I, I had had Magneto finished and then I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to try my hardest to get this one finished. And I remember working around the clock and stayed up as much as I could, you know, before passing out and stuff. And I just, no matter what I did, I, I couldn't get it finished in time. So I still have the base that I made for this model okay. that she's not, that I didn't have a chance to get it finished. So the, the place that she's actually mounted on um, was just the block of wood that I had fixed her to for painting, and I wasn't planning on using as a base. But I ended up having to take her to Chicago with me, pretty much like 75% of the way done. And then I had to finish it while I was at the convention. And um, so the base is made entirely up of uh, a couple of grass tufts, some birch pods for leaves and then everything else on it was literally taken out of a flower pot at the convention center. <laughs> now that is some A plus scrounging right there. That's amazing. And I kid you not, it was probably like I had just done the painting. It was raining outside that day. So I didn't even have dry basing material to work with. It was wet. And um, I glued it on an hour before the deadline, painted the vegetation for that hour, put my grass tufts on, put a couple of birch pods in, you know, strategic places, stuck it in, called it good, and then somebody bought it off of me at the convention, and uh, it now was in um, Los Angeles. Well, there you go. How about that? Yeah, it's um, a, yeah. it's a super cool piece. I think the horse came out great. I love the subtle blue blue grays. I love the texturing to it, capturing the like the fur where the horse is, uh, you know, like uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's actually I guess it's hair or fur or whatever it is, where that fur is being refle is reflecting the light out. I think it looks really nice. Yeah, yeah, it was it, so. Um, like I said, I never really painted a, a horse at this scale anyway, so it was um, a bit of a challenge in that aspect because. I was aware of, you know, like they do have fur and, you know, how do I get that to reflect? And then if I want it to read as a black horse, then 
you know, you can't just do black with, you know, gray highlights. You have to have some color in there. So um, there's actually a dark purple in there for the shadows just to give it, which is more on the red side. So it gives it a little bit of an earthy and also um, some hints of like flesh tone, like there's blood flowing through the horse, which is just a subconscious cue to our minds. And then otherwise the highlights are a light, um, a light desaturated blue. And um, the color scheme that I, I used for this was heavily influenced by the movie 300. Sure. The very bright red cloak. Yeah, I can see that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. but everything else is desaturated other than this for the most part. And so that was, it, I don't know, she just kind of um, struck me as being like a uh, an angry goddess coming down from, you know, Mount Olympus or whatever. And um, so I kind of just ran with that theme. So I, I had 300 on in the background when I started painting this and just kind of went with that. Nice. Uh, somebody in the, in the audience asked, uh, can you explain the choice for the skin tone? It looks very natural, but what, what made you, what made you choose this particular skin tone? Um, so the skin tone I chose just based on the colors that you see in the movie 300. So with Xerxes, he tends to be a bit more of like a, a golden color. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to bring that tone in to, you know, indicate that she's, of at least a partly divine entity. Nice. Nice. Okay. Good answer. All right. That brings mm -hmm. us to the end of that. So I'm going to, I'm going to minimize this. So you're back on camera now. All right. <laughs> Hello again. Okay. So let's, uh, let's go to some Q and a, um, if anybody in the audience has any, any other questions you want to ask, feel free to put those in now. Uh, and we'll we'll do a couple of those questions if if there's any out there that people have. But first, we've got my lightning round questions. Here we go. Are you ready, Meg, for the lightning round challenge questions? I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever be ready, man. But shoot, anyway. All right, here we go. Question one, and you must answer with only one answer. That's why it's challenging. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Who is your favorite miniature painter, past or present? Yourself, not. I included. don't. I don't have one. <laughs> Zero answers. Yeah, and that's only because so I kind of like my um, choice in music. I don't have bands that I follow. I have songs that I like. Okay. And so it's similar to your painting. Like I enjoy individual compositions from multiple artists. I don't necessarily follow any one artist. All right, that's fair enough. So you told me that you don't follow bands, but you get, but you like, but you go for songs, particular compositions. Then I'm gonna flip the script on this question. I'm not gonna let you escape that easy, okay? So, what is your favorite single piece from an artist? Then, because if you if you like the songs, there's got to be one song that stands out. Uh -huh. <laughs> and you brought this on you yourself. Know. Yeah, I mean, I I did, but um. I mean, again, with music, I don't necessarily have one ultimate favorite song. Mm -hmm. it, it it really kind of depends on my on my mood. Sure. Um, and you know, I mean, there's pieces like there's new pieces being produced every day by hundreds of people around the world. Like, how do you how do you choose just one? Sure. So give give us one that struck you for some reason or had an emotional resonance in your life somewhere. Hmm. All right, so I guess like one that always seems to come to mind if like people ask me about, you know, like what are, what are, what's my top 10 essentially? Sure. Like one that always comes up is um, Tommy Soul's Flower Night. Nice. Okay. I know exactly yeah. the Flower Night you're talking about. That was probably the first time I ever saw really like excellently executed um, non metallic metals like ever in my life and thought that's how nomatog metals need to be done. Not this like super ultra cartoony anime way that you see most of the time. Nice. That is a very solid answer. The fact that I immediately, I knew the mini you were talking about could conjure it in my mind and agree with you completely, by the way. Um, he yeah. does a bunch of NMM stuff now on like Instagram and on his YouTube and stuff. So it's, yeah. it's worth it. Worth a check out. All right. Not to mention he's just a cool guy. Like he's, he's one of the, the, um, you know, eccentric miniature painters that I really enjoy following anyway. So he's just, yeah, he's a bit of fun. Yep. He, he, he is a very, like, I've never had the pleasure of meeting him, but just following him. I'm like, he seems like a really cool guy. <laughs> like it just, yeah, he's, he's somebody you could sit down and have a beer with. Right. 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 
exactly. Okay, yeah. next one. Next next lightning round challenge question. Here we go. What is your favorite color? I mean, can I have two or do I need to have one? Uh, give me at least a first and second place, even if it's only by okay. a smidge. Okay, so first place would probably be like cyan, teal, you mm -hmm. know, sure. that was sort of green, blue, and then second place would be purple. I support both of these choices. They are A plus choices. Uh, I mean, Zach, were, were you ever on the Reaper forums back in the day, Vince? Like, I was not. Back, back. No, so um, in in the forums, for those of you who, who you know, have been born like since forums died, um, <laughs> you used to be able to have like, like little signatures and things where you could upload uh, images and banners and, you know, you can have silly things just posted in there. And so um, there was one person who went around the Reaper forums and, and based on your recurring color choices, you would be inducted into the cult of purple and teal. And so I had, I was inducted into that cult because of my use of purple and teal. Nice. I, I feel like I would, I'm, I'm simpatico with all the members of yeah. that cult. Yes. I would fit, get, yeah. fit right along. <laughs> All right. Uh, last question of my lightning round questions. Here we go. You can construe the word type however you like. Okay. Like type okay. can mean anything. What is your favorite type of minis to paint? Um, so, I mean, I think most people would probably agree that I tend to gravitate more towards females. If we're thinking of gender as a type, sure, could be. Um, yeah, and uh, I mean, for for me, I really enjoy painting um, females that again have some armor or some interesting clothing going on, um, usually in a strong stance, strong pose of some sort. And I feel like um, recently we're seeing more of those types of minis being sculpted. With what previously, when I first got into minis like 17 years ago. Um, that that was definitely not the norm for female figures. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Perfectly fair answer. Okay. So a couple questions from the audience. Um, I, I would I would probably say ugly duckling. Here's a question that you might want to reach out to Meg about, but I suspect I, I know what the answer is. Uh, but it was the class in March in Brisbane. Uh huh. <laughs> Somebody wanted to know what happened with that. I suspect it's probably a uh, a, a COVID situation there. So I don't know. Um, it is, and uh, I like that he's reaching out on here. Um, so I I am planning on emailing everybody today after this interview. I went ahead and got everybody's email addresses last night that had signed up in the class because um, I had like half of my registration split between the email and Facebook. So I just needed to get one contact point for everyone. And um, so I will email you guys later today so that we can discuss the situation and figure out what the best method is. Um, I mean, to, to that degree, if, if you don't, don't mind me talking about it just for a few minutes. Please. I don't mind um, at all. Please go right ahead. While it's a serious concern here, I don't think it's as serious as like the U.S. and Europe at the moment. Right. Um, we had as many cases and... Um, our population is a lot more spread out than it is in the U.S. and Europe. Oh, like where I am, there has not been a single case. We've had multiple people tested for it within our community. Um, to give you guys an idea of like how small a town I live in, though, there's like 25,000 people here, and that's considered big for the area that gotcha. I live in. Like we're the city for the farm towns. Um, so we're still okay where I am, um, and I have been sick with a cold for the last two weeks, which I'm sure you can hear I'm a little snuffly still. Um, uh, so I've been on, on self-isolation for, I was on self-isolation for like 10 days while I was getting over it, just at my doctor's um, orders. Uh, and that was more just to mitigate my exposure if anybody in our community had contracted COVID-19. Um, but, you know... <laughs> Yeah, like I, I've been watching things on a on a daily basis. <laughs> I don't usually watch the news, but I've started watching the news, you know, morning and night just to see what's happening so I can make the appropriate decisions for class. Um, they have not banned domestic travel here, so that's still okay. However, they are talking about banned domestic travel. So 
I'm waiting to see what's going to be said either today or maybe on Monday at the latest to make a decision on whether or not we're going to postpone the Brisbane class again because it was already postponed once. So I was trying not to postpone it again if I didn't have to. But um, I've got this class in Brisbane in March and then another class in Perth in April. And um, we, we just may have to postpone it till later in the year. Completely understandable. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I had to delay two of my own classes for the same reason. It's yeah. it's what happens, right? Like that. That's it's where we are right now, and this is the time when it's often better to be a little on the safe side. Let's all you know, like we'll yeah. we'll all get through it, and then it'll be fine, and it'll be back. You know, we'll be we'll be back and teaching and sharing and gathering together. But uh, we get to that point faster if we do the safe stuff now. So. Yeah, that's it. And um, I mean, I also have had a private coaching that was scheduled for um, the school holidays here. So there's regular school holidays, like every um, three months, the kids have two weeks off. Um, so I had one scheduled for during the school holidays, which is coming up in a couple of weeks. And um, even that person contacted me recently and said, hey, should we cancel this, postpone it, do you want to go ahead? And I'm like, well, you know, as long as both of us are healthy and we've not been around anybody who has the virus, like, I don't really see any harm in going ahead with a one-on-one, -on -one. like, it's just at my house, so right. just one other person. So that's all, I guess that's also an option for anybody who may be within driving distance of me who has been healthy and has not been exposed to anything. If you still want to get some miniature painting lessons in um, where we have our studio set up. I can accommodate a couple of people at a time. Uh, so if anyone is interested in doing a private coaching, I'm up for that because most likely we're all going to be locked down here shortly for a few weeks. There you go. All right. So I think this is an interesting question to end on here. This is, this is a great last question. And so Marco asked, is there a moment when you realized you were good, however you defined that at painting. I find this to be such a fascinating question because it's like, was there a mini you painted almost how I'd rephrase this? Is there a mini that you painted that you were happy with? And you thought, Oh, okay. Like, yeah, I achieved what I wanted there or something like that. Like, was there ever an aha moment for you or was it boiling the frog kind of thing? So, um, <laughs> I don't know. Some people are probably going to say that what I'm about to answer with is a bunch of bullshit, but sorry <laughs> if that's not allowed. To um, um, I'm, I'm always happy when I achieve what I want to achieve on a miniature. Right. And for me, I usually sit down with the idea that I'm going to improve upon one thing every time I paint. Like that's, that's how I set my goals. I try not to set, you know, too much from that, from the start Otherwise, I'll get overwhelmed, um, which I think Trent talked about when he was on with his article that he had written recently about setting bite-sized goals. Don't try and do too much at once. Right. Um, so I'm happy if I just achieve what I want to achieve. If the miniature comes out looking something like what I had pictured in my head, and I recognize I'm a decent painter, but I don't necessarily sit there and go, oh, yeah, I'm Meg Maples. I'm the best. Like, I'm such a good painter. <laughs> like, I, I don't. And then the funny thing is I have been accused over the years of thinking I'm way better than I am. And I'm like, you guys really don't know me if that's what, if that's what you think I think. Like, I, I just. I paint. I enjoy painting. And a lot of people have just said they get you know, a lot out of coming to my classes. And, and I think my real ability is I'm able to deconstruct and explain how processes are completed in miniature painting. I, I can reverse engineer things and I can teach it in a way that people understand it. I think I'm stronger at that than I am actually at miniature painting itself. But miniature painting is just something I like to do. I, I think there's always a bit of that. I've talked to so many, and because one, I feel that myself. When people ask me, like, are you an artist? I, my, my constant answer is no. I've never felt like that. And there's always that thing where I, I feel sometimes happy, but I never feel satisfied, I guess, is kind of the way I put it, right? Um, I'm like, if you felt satisfied with your painting, you would stop. Right. That's a yes. Thank you. Yes, that's exactly right, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
Like this is this is the problem. With, so uh, with that sort of answer, Vince, you're definitely an artist. <laughs> Artists are people who are constantly in the pursuit of improvement. I'm not going to say perfection because I think that the, there's negative connotations there, but we're always Agreed. seeking improvement in our abilities and we're never 100% satisfied with what we produce. Yep. That, which I, I, keeps coming to us. Yep. I completely agree. Well, that's yeah. very nice of you to say. And I'm going to turn that around and say, uh, Meg, you're not just a good. Uh, miniature artist you're a great miniature artist and you should know that uh because that is absolutely true uh as i as i mentioned at the beginning and i'll reiterate now you really have been someone who's inspired me so much in my own hobby and i i don't i, I there are, anybody who listens to me regularly who's watching this show will hear you say things and they'll be like oh yeah sure that's like it's, you know vince seems to say a lot of the same things because it's simpatico right like as there's probably it's transmuted there yes yeah, I mean, and so I'm glad to hear that I've had such a positive influence on somebody out there. I mean, I know it's more than just one person, but it's still as somebody whose goal is to teach and to try and better a community and um, foster a cooperative community as well. Like that's always a good thing to hear that what I'm doing is having the effect that I want it to have. Absolutely. All right. So, Meg, thank you so much. I really appreciate you sitting down with me. All of Meg's socials, uh, her, her site, everything uh, is going to be down below. So please do go check that out. Uh, as Meg has mentioned, she does teach plenty of classes, uh, especially if you're in Australia. Go check out Crystal Dragon if you're going to be anywhere near that. I cannot recommend that enough. So uh, please go do that. Check that stuff out. Meg, thank you one more time for being here. No worries. You're coming back next year, right? I'm coming back next year. Yeah, I mean, assuming they let me fly to Australia. Assuming this is all past... I am there, and I'm. it's not a thing I'm going to miss. And I'm going to have my schedule better suited to where I've got a whole day at minimum to just sit up there and chill and paint. That's what I'm looking for. I just advocate just, just coming just for Crystal Dragon. Just blow everybody <laughs> else off and just come and hang out with us for the whole three days. Like, that's fine. It's a, it's a good – I'll, I'll see what I can get away with. Uh, All right. For, for all of you out there watching, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget, hit that like button, because the more you hit like, the more that stuff happens, the more engagement, the more YouTube recommends this video, and more people find it and see all of this that we've talked about today, which I really appreciate, and the artists that I interview really appreciate. So please do hit that like button. It means a great deal to me. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody, for watching. Meg, thank you again. And as always, we'll see you next time.